Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Rob Silverman, Amazon best-selling author of Inside Out Health and ACA Sports Council Chiropractor the Year 2015. I'm here to discuss immunology and viral load updates for the sports chiropractor. Without question, this is taking the world, no pun intended, by storm. Everybody's talked about our immune system. We've all really uh, have a crystal clear uh, need, understanding for the need to understand our immune system, our patient's immune system, and without question, the athlete's immune system. I think that we take for granted so often that athletes are superhuman. They can't catch a cold. They won't get a compromised immune system, but that may not necessarily be the case. In fact, many athletes may be susceptible to immune compromise because of their travel, their inability to get the foods, their exposure to toxins in their environment, and of course, the fact that they're always exercising. And over two hours of exercise can become very detrimental to one's natural innate immune system. So I just want to thank very much. Nutridyne, they always do a great job. There's a code if you want to get anything from them, Dr. Rob forward slash sports and a phone number. If there's any protocols or have anything that you need that I've talked about, I'll also um, share with you my contact information if you have some uh, burning questions that you need answered. One of my favorite terms, I always like to start with a quote is, you can't control the virus, but you can control the host. Now, when we say a host, host has a very positive connotation. Host refers to the idea that you're going to be very nice to everybody. You want to be what we call an inhospitable host. You want to be that inhospitable host so that virus doesn't want to stay. Viruses are not live. They're activated or inactivated. We don't want to allow that host in and allow it to become activated because it can become very detrimental to our overall health. How do we become an inhospitable host? Well, one, we really don't want to let them in the door. We don't want to let them in our body. We don't want to have any breaks in our barrier. Two, once they're there, we don't want to feed them. And three, we want to make the environment very uncomfortable where they want to leave. So we want to become inhospitable hosts. Factors that make us more likely to contract COVID-19 or comorbidities to COVID-19. I'm going to... Uh, pull a few of them and put them together. Number one would be CBD, two, diabetes, three, obesity, four, hypertension. And then I'm going to skip down the list and get to autoimmune conditions. All five of them without question can be attributed to lifestyle changes or failure in lifestyle. Now, most interesting in that you have CBD, diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and that autoimmunity, you may be able to, as I seed you for a later slide and a later theme, you may be able to relate that to failing gut health. In any case, I'm a big proponent that lifestyle plays a major role to your overall immune function. Having said that, age is without question a comorbidity for COVID-19. So, are, so is damage to pulmonary disease, chronic liver or kidney disease, radiation therapy, and you may even consider chronic neurological disease a lifestyle disease and without question connected with failing gut health. Underlying conditions among adults uh, that are hospitalized with COVID-19 very interesting breakdown. For those that are in the age bracket of 18 to 49, the number one reason that they were hospitalized was obesity. The age group of 50 to 64, the number one reason for hospitalization was obesity. Over 65, obesity became number two. And the number one reason for hospitalization in the over 65 group was hypertension. So, 18 to 64, obesity is the number one reason for hospitalization. That just is a mind-blowing stat. And we're talking about people in the U.S. Uh, you are really getting to the conceivable idea that most of the population is unhealthy. Now, I will piggyback on that idea with these next set of slides. Obesity is linked to severe coronavirus, especially for younger patients. Obesity is an important predictor of coronavirus illness. The U.S., number one 
of the highest obesity rates in the world. And surprisingly, and unfortunately, younger adults are at a particular risk. Obesity is linked to severe coronavirus, especially for younger patients. The hypothesis was very simple. Obesity may have already allowed the patients to be and have a compromised respiratory function prior to infection. Two, they may already have abdominal obesity. Typically, abdominal obesity is more prominent in men over women. This obesity can cause compression of the diaphragm, lungs, and chest capacity. Lastly, obesity causes chronic low-grade inflammation and an increase in circulating pro-inflammatory cytokines, which actually play a role in the worst COVID-19 outcomes. Cytokines, which lead us to that cytokine storm. We're referring to the ideas of people who are obese are inflamed. Fat cells are depositories for toxins. These fat cells hold and house these toxins, which increase your inflammatory issues. So when I see somebody or, that comes to my office, whether they're a regular patient or an athlete, and they're overweight, and there's still some athletes who body fat are not appropriate, you have to understand that they are without question inflamed. Obesity and COVID-19, the role of visceral adipose tissue. Here in this study, there was 30 patients that were positive for COVID-19. It was their visceral fat that was increased by one square decimeter that was associated with a 22.5 fold increase for risk to go into the ICU and a 16.11 increase fold risk to go on a mechanical ventilation. As we all know, when you get to the ICU, you're really sick. The ventilation, people's outcomes were not that good. When it, you compared it to just upper abdominal circumference, each additional centimeter increased 1.13 fold the risk for ICU and 1.25 respectively for mechanical ventilation. Really not a big deal. Lastly, no increased risks with subcutaneous fats or BMI. So one, let's take a step back. Let's define what visceral fat is. Visceral fat is the fat that's over your viscera that can infiltrate all different organs in your cavities, in your abdominal cavity, your chest cavity, your heart, your liver, and the such. Visceral fat is without question extremely inflammatory. The upper abdominal, not so much. And even if you were heavy, subcutaneous, or your BMI height overweight, which is something I don't really use, but still out there as a marker, does not affect your outcome. It's that visceral inflammatory fat. So the idea of the immune system is without question to function well to manage and modulate inflammation. Is this truly COVID-19 a preventable lifestyle disease? Well, let's take a look at the numbers. Underlying chronic illness, 42% of Americans were obese. 75% of Americans were obese and overweight. Three out of four people have a weight problem. Six out of 10 Americans have at least one chronic illness. And four out of 10 have more than one chronic illness. Obesity increases the risk of death by three times. And everything that we just mentioned leads to that drastic set your body on fire term called inflammation. Preventable lifestyle disease, to take another step far, further, there's the belly fat. You know, um, it's more than can you pinch in it. It's that hard belly fat. It's that visceral fat that's pushing out the belly to make that belly fat look bigger. Older metabolically challenged people over 65, pre-diabetic and diabetic, about half the people in 60, or that were over 65 have this issue. We all know that people age, the older they get, the more decreased immune function. We call that immunosenescence. And lastly, huge stat, 12% of the U.S. population is metabolically healthy. That's one in 7.5 people actually is metabolically healthy that you come into contact with. Long-term coronavirus or long-term exposure to air pollution really increase COVID-19 mortality rate in the US. Coronavirus people that had higher levels of air pollution were more likely to die from the infection. This is one of the first links between long-term exposure to pollution and COVID-19 death rates. These particles 
were associated with increased death rates. People living for decades in a country where there's high levels of particle matter were 15% more likely to die from coronavirus. And last, the particle matters come from fuel combustions, automotives, refineries, power plant, and tobacco smoke. All this data was compiled over 17 years, and it was compiled for more than 3,000 countries. The takeaway is your environment, a lot of contributors to your environment or bad environment is without question the air in which you breathe. Smell and taste is a major player when it comes to coronavirus. The loss of smell and taste has that association. Without question, it should be included in the screening measure. So the findings of this study were very simple. If you had smell and taste loss, you were more than 10 times more likely to have COVID-19. The outcome was pretty quick. The rate of recovery for your smell and your taste was two to four weeks. But what did the loss of smell and taste tell you? It tells you that there's damage to the cranial nerves. And that fact alone shows that COVID-19 has a central nervous system component. Why does SARS-CoV-2 spread so easily? Well, we're finding out that it may not be quite as virulent as we thought, but without question, it definitely spreads as much as we thought. So let's take a step back. Let's take a look at this and analyze this. SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2 share 86% of the same genetic sequence. Specifically, a few genetic studies have investigated the microscopic structure of the virus, a key protein on its surface, and a receptor in human cells that may collectively explain why the virus can attack and spread so easily. This spike protein on the new coronavirus. Spike proteins are what coronavirus is used to bind to the membrane of the human cells that they infect. The binding process is activated by certain cell enzymes. SARS-CoV-2 has a specific structure that allows it to bind at least 10 times more tightly than the corresponding spike protein of the previous SARS-CoV to the common host receptor. So partly this is due to the fact that the spike protein contains a site that recognizes and becomes activated by an enzyme called furin, which we're going to talk about in a moment. So the key receptors on human cells, Spike proteins and furin activations are not the whole story. The human cell also contains elements that make it more vulnerable to the new coronavirus. The spike proteins need to bind on a human cell called angiotensin converting enzyme 2 or ACE2. Research has shown that ACE2 allows SARS-CoV-2 to infect human cells. Moreover, SARS-CoV-2 binds to ACE2 with higher affinity than other coronaviruses, and this is part of the reason that the SARS-CoV-2 binds 10 times more tightly than to the host SARS-CoV-2. Now let's touch and talk about the furin. The presence of furin enzymes on all cell surfaces cleaves and activates the SARS-CoV-2 into a wide range of tissues and organs all at once. Activated. It unleashes the NLRP3 inflammasome, initiating a flurry of immune reactions that can result in cytokine storms. Furin cleavage allows the virus entry into basically all cell types, marking the COVID-19 easy transmission at rates thousand times greater than the more virulent SARS. The tropism of the coronavirus is due to the furin cleavage site in the spike protein, SARS-CoV-2. This is not present once again in SARS-CoV. So the presence of furines on almost all the cell surfaces allow a dramatically increased ability to fuse to the host cells. And lastly, as you'll see in one of the slides coming up, we see a three cleave protease, which is once they have entered the human cells, coronaviruses produce damage and spread to other cells by creating an enzyme called 3CL protease. Although several enzymes may be involved in viral replication and spread, 3CL protease is the most important for the coronavirus family. And let's look at this ACE2. The SARS-CoV-2 infects alveolar epithelial cells through ACE2 receptor. The destruction of the epithelial cells and the increase of cell permeability lead to the release of virus. The SARS-CoV-2 activate the innate immune system 
macrophages and other innate immune cells not only capture the virus, but also release a large number of cytokines and chemokines, including the stealthy cytokine interleukin-6. Adaptive immunity is activated by the antigen-presenting cells. T and B cells not only play an antiviral role, but also directly or indirectly promote the secretion of inflammatory cytokines. In addition, under the stimulation of inflammatory factors, a large number of inflammatory exudates and erythrocytes enter alveolar, resulting in dyspnea and maybe respiratory failure. So the ACE2 gut microbiota and cardiovascular health are all intertwined because all three of them have a lot of ACE2 receptor sites. I found this study very interesting. So we had nine alcoholic fatty liver disease in patients that were positive for COVID-19. 202 patients that actually were entering the hospital with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, 50%. During the process of the hospitalization, that 50% increased to 72.5%. And the reason was there's an abundant, as we said before, amount of ACE2 receptors in the small intestine and on the liver. The liver contains the largest amount of macrophages for an organ in the body. Macrophages are a part of the innate immune system. There is a strong correlation between the gut and the liver and the liver in the gut. Axis. And without question, sugar in obesity was implicated in this study. The immune system provides three levels of defense against disease causing organisms. We forget about level one barriers like skin barrier, like mucus barriers, stomach acid and digestive enzymes, beneficial bacteria that live in the colon, your gut microbiota your barrier before it gets to stimulate your immune system, your two legs, your two prongs of your immune system. So prong number one is innate immunity. That immune system was what we were given, you know, since day one of mankind. It's what white blood cells called neutrophils and macrophages, which engulf and destroy foreign invaders and damaged cells. They're called the search and destroy cells. Your acquired immunity, we got that mankind approximately 10,000 years ago. We call it acquired or adaptive immunity. It has what we call B and T cells. The B and T cells are very interesting in that the T cells come from the thymus and they're sort of recognized um, antigens, whereas the B cells are your antibodies. They memorize some of the problems with COVID-19 was that people have not been exposed to this genetic strain and their immune system had no recognition, i.e. no antibodies to it. The humoral and the cell mediated branches of the immune system comprise of lymphocytes of the B cell lineage. Antibodies are the effector molecules produced by this response. The process begins with the interaction of B cells with antigens. Binding of the antigen promotes differentiation into antibody secreting cells, those are plasma cells. The cell-mediated branch comprises lymphocytes of the T cell lineage. In a nutshell, B cells made from the bone ultimately make antigens and you get an antigen antibody expression. Whereas the T cells come from the thymus, they ultimately are able to kill infected cells. So some terms I want us all to discuss. Number one, immune support. You want to support your immune system through lifestyle, through chiropractic, through proper supplementation. Immune boosting isn't really something that we want to do. We don't want to boost one leg of our immune system. Our immune support, our immune balance, that's a very critical element to overall immune health. Immunosenescence refers to the gradual deterioration of the immune system brought on by natural age advancement. The adaptive system is affected more than the innate immune system. Immunosenescence, a critical element to overall understanding of our immune system as we age. Synolytics is a, among a, cl a class of small molecules under basic research to determine if they can 
selectively induce death or senescent cells and improve health in humans. So essentially it's cell death, immunorejuvenation. Immunorejuvenation is most interesting and is that is what we want. So if we do some intermittent fasting, time-restrictive eating, and we're able to self-devour our cells and have new cells come, we are in essence immunorejuvenating our immune system and our cells. Immunophenotyping is a test used to identify cells on the basis of the types of makers or antigens present on a cell surface, nucleus, or cytoplasm. This technology helps identify the lineage of the cells using antibodies that detect makers or antigens on the cell, hence the immunoreference. So what you wanna do is you wanna support your immune system. Here are certain ideas that aid you in supporting your immune system. Number one, avoid certain foods. Use my acronym, GPS. GPS, no gluten, no processed food, and no sugar. Sugar is a toxin. It works with the reward center in your brain. When mice were offered sugar versus cocaine, 94% of mice took sugar over cocaine. It is without question the most commonly used drug over the counter in America today. Also adhere to avoiding DNA. No dairy, very allergic. People are highly allergic to dairy. No nicotine, smoking is a no bueno. And the A stands for artificial sweeteners. Artificial sweeteners pose an issue. They actually fool your brain into thinking that your carbohydrate has been consumed. There's been incidents in the data that indicate that insulin resistance has come from the use of artificial sweeteners. Artificial sweeteners can damage your microbiota, lead you down a path of an increased incidence of dementia and stroke. I always believe to adhere and follow to an anti-inflammatory diet. No fried foods, no trans fats. And now is the time, without question, to detect or avoid food sensitivities. It's a great time to do so because if you're sensitive to a food, not only will you damage your gut permeability or increase your gut permeability, it increases your inflammation. And too many people don't understand that food or bad food is a potentiator for inflammation. Good food is a potentiator for health information. So diet for immune resilience. Immune resilience, your immune system should be resilient. Proper diet enhances your immunity versus a poor diet, which may impair your immunity. So support your immune system. Make clean eating a priority. Eat wild smash fish. Smash is an acronym for salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, and herring. Eat a more plant-based diet, a great choice. Consume fruits and vegetables to your heart's content, especially green leafy vegetables. Consume your grass-fed meats. High fiber is great. Fiber is a good prebiotic. It feeds your probiotic. It allows you to have good gut health. Nuts and seeds are great choices. They're non-saturated trans fat foods. Chicken soup. Every ethnic group's own natural penicillin, if you will. Then moving on to the snacks. Nobody I know minds an organic dark chocolate. The herbs you may want to include in your cooking or in your drinks would be ginger and turmeric. Bone broth, collagen. Collagen type one and three is a great choice. Helps with skin, hair, and nails and gut. And collagen type two is great for joints. An appropriate fluid intake, hydration. You should consume at least half your body's body weight in ounces in hydration. Drink organic coffee and tea. Coffee is the most consumed beverage in America, highly full of pesticides. The three most sprayed items in America are cotton, tobacco, and coffee. So just switching to organic coffee is a critical element. Oils, extra virgin olive oil, avocado, macadamia nut, mushrooms, tremendous immune supporting items like shiitake, turkey tail, oyster, lion's mane. But when you would include nuts, avocado, and olive oil in your diet, you're actually increasing your oleic acid from these foods, which will stimulate the CERT1, which is your defense enzyme. 
consider a time-restrictive eating or intermittent fast. Interesting, intermittent fasting refers to the idea in the parlance of not eating for a day or missing a couple of days of food. So it's really time-restrictive eating, fasting in a window and eating in a window. So a typical time-restrictive eating would be 16 and 8. 16, the first number, refers to the fast. 8 refers to the amount of hours that you are eating. A lot of tremendous good health benefits come from this time-restrictive eating, if you would, intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is a terrific regulator of the immune system as it controls the amount of inflammatory cytokines that are released in the body. Studies have shown that fasting reduces the release of inflammatory interleukin-6 and TNF. It also produces autophagy. Autophagy is that what we talked about, your body's immune system that breaks cells, self-devouring to make new, fresh cells. It actually promotes your innate immune system. Intermittent fasting stimulates autophagy process, which restricts viral infections. That is exciting without question. Studies have also shown that short fasts and fast mimicking diets also had benefits to our body. Water fasting was a little too detrimental. Get some good, sufficient sleep. Aim for seven to eight good quality hours. Sleep resets your immune system. Home exercise or an exercise plan. We know all athletes need to exercise. Movement, quality movement is a key to good exercise plans. Humidity. So you want what we call a relative humidity. A good relative humidity in your house would be about approximately 50%. Looking at the impact of nutrition on COVID-19 susceptibility and long-term consequences, high-rate consumption in diets of saturated fats, sugars, refined carbs, they really refer to the standard American diet, which is sad, or the typical Western diet, which is referred to as WD. They both lead to an increase in obesity and type 2 diabetes. The Western diet consumption activates the innate immune system while impairing the adaptive immunity which leads to chronic inflammation and impaired host defense against viruses. So essentially it is knocking the balance of your two prongs of your immune system. So when your innate immune system goes too high, there's too much inflammation. And when your adaptive immune system goes down, there's no or not enough antibody production. Piggybacking on that some, saturated fats can lead to the chronic activation also of an innate immune system and the inhibition of the adaptive. So increasing saturated fats induces lipotoxic states and activates that innate immune system. That bad diet of the Western diet with the saturated fats inhibits both B and T cell function, induces B cell apoptosis, and leads to B cell immunodepression. Your increased innate and decreased adaptive leads to chronic inflammation and impaired defenses against viral pathogens. Your diet is actually having a very strong impact on your immune system, i.e. on your health. Continuing, increased peripheral inflammation for COVID-19 leads to increased neurodegenerative diseases. The conclusion is very simple. Lifestyle habits, or poor lifestyle habits will make you very susceptible to COVID-19 and also susceptible to poor recovery. The authors, the medical doctor authors, recommend individuals to refrain from a poor diet and consume high amounts of nutrients to boost immune function. So let's talk a little bit about some immune support supplements. Vitamin C. Vitamin C has a wide range of biological roles in humans, working as a major antioxidant, as such, vitamin C is critical for supporting oxidative stress, energy production, and immune function. It's also necessary for synthesizing key neurotransmitters, especially norepinephrine and dopamine, and supporting healthy liver functions. Zinc citrate. Zinc is a very overlooked supplement. So zinc is interesting in that it enables you to promote a healthy immune system. It supports healthy cellular metabolism. It supports DNA integrity. It promotes reproductive function and supports GI integrity and permeability. 
mixed mushroom. Clinical evidence has really shown that mushrooms have shown to improve and give health promoting properties. We all know vitamin D. We're going to do some slides in a few minutes on vitamin D, the probiotics also. Liposomal glutathione. Glutathione, the master antioxidant, is one of the body's major endogenous antioxidants and is involved in many metabolic reactions. Low, level, low levels of this peptide are associated with high levels of oxidative stress and impairments in nearly every system in the body, especially immune system. Therefore, supplementing makes a lot of sense. Liposomal. Liposomal technology is a critical element. Glutathione straight on its own will die in the stomach from stomach acid. The liposomal encases and protects the glutathione, allowing it to get to the desired area and share with the body all its antioxidant benefits. Beta-glucans, omega-3 fatty acids, elderberry, and without question, Vitamin A. Everybody knows the story about vitamin A. Vitamin A is a critical element to overall immune support. Vitamin C hospitals were utilizing, uh, New York City hospitals were utilizing vitamin C. With their COVID-19 patients in the ICU, many doctors were injecting 1,500 milligrams of vitamin C three to four times a day. And what they found out was everybody who received that with a little ozone and Oral vitamin D did not have to go on respirators. So here you're seeing vitamin D is quite positive against rhinovirus, RSV, and influenza virus. Having said all that, vitamin D is a critical element because it's hormone D. Vitamin D is so important because it's shown to work with a multitude of pathways and has a multitude of immune enhancing properties. Vitamin D supplementation helps prevent acute respiratory tract infections. People found out that those who were lower in vitamin D actually responded better to vitamin D supplementation. Vitamin D or VDR in microbiome in the intestine and other putative organs. There are two main sources to get vitamin D, exposure to sunlight and food. Vitamin D and its receptor VDR regulate gut microbiome, maintaining barrier functions and inhibit inflammation in the intestines. Bidirectional host microbiome interactions seem related to the vitamin D VDR in the intestine and also impact lung, liver, and other organs. Great data published on COVID-19 severity and vitamin D levels. So for me, I want my patients at 60 to 80. 40 to 60 is shown to have good outcomes. Here we have above 30, and you can see the precipitous drop in people having severity or cases of COVID-19. So vitamin D, D3, D3 with K2, D3 with K2, 5,000 to 10,000 IUs with a meal. So you're seeing the influence of the microbiota on viral infections. The microbiota of the host activates the inflammasome by priming signal one for interleukin-1 beta and interleukin-18 secretion. The secretion of these cytokines induce migration of dendritic cells from the lung to the draining lymph node where they prime T cells. The downstream effect of T cell priming is protection of the host against influenza virus-induced pathology. That was the protection, the indirect promotion. The microbiota of the host stimulate the proliferation of lymphoid cells that are targeted by the virus. Direct promotion. Microbial ligands such as LPS are utilized by viruses to enhance their attachment to target cells or to counteract the antivirus immune response by activating the toll-like receptor 4 pathway, which leads to interleukin-10 production. Probiotics in this study, this was a 12-week study where participants had contracted a cold four times in the past year. The conclusion was consumption of probiotics significantly reduced the incidence of upper respiratory infection and flu-like symptoms. Glutathione, we talked about it before, the master antioxidant. 
The conclusion in his study, very simply, for glutathione and COVID-19 pneumonia, both oral and IV glutathione and its precursors, NAC, with the combination of alpha lipoic acid, represented a treatment approach for blocking NF-kappa B, the signal transducer of inflammation, in addressing the cytokine storm syndrome and respiratory distress in patients with COVID-19 pneumonia. Beta-glucans. Beta-glucans are a great mix with those immune-supporting mushrooms. They're compounds that regulate the function of the innate immune system. They are, without question, working with the immune system as the first line of defense against viruses and bacteria. Elderberry, really got beat up at the beginning of COVID-19, a beautiful herb. Contains several functional bioactive compounds, flavonoids, phenolytic acids. These phenolytic compounds are potential modulators of the immune response. They decrease inflammation. They're able to do so by reducing the production of interleukin-16, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, and ROS. Here's an interesting study that speaks to Sambucus niga extracts inhibiting infectious bronchitis virus in early point during replication. So when you see 20 minutes prior and 24 hours prior, the graph really speaks volumes. 24 hours prior to exposure is the opportune time to take your elderberry. So here you're seeing viral and cellular membranes in that it's sort of a review of some of the earlier slides in what we talked about. RNA virus must enter a human cell, replicate and damage the cell, escaping to infect adjacent cells. For viruses, there are three enzymes that play a critical role in this sequence, the ACE2, furine, and the 3CL protease. They all will stimulate the NLRP3 inflammasome, the start of the cytokine storm syndrome. Viroporines activity and the activation of inflammasomes. Viroporines activates activities can be clustered into three main groups that have been linked to the activation of the NLRP3 inflammasome. The first group of vi of viroporines pump protons and dissipates proton gradient across trans-Golgi network of influenza A virus. The second group manipulates calcium homostasis, stimulating calcium flux from intracellular storage to the cytosol, providing the second signal for the NLRP3 activation and interleukin-1 beta production, such as in the instance of 2B of polio and rhinovirus. The third group increases mitochondria stress and affects ROS production, such as in the 3A of the coronavirus. So here are some signals required for the activation and the release of interleukin 1B and interleukin 18. You're looking at these two different signals. Each signal has a different activation, ultimately getting down to the point of, inter of releasing interleukin 1 beta and interleukin 18. Cytokines, this infamous cytokine storm. Take a look at the imagery of the cytokine. Pro-inflammatory cytokines defend host cells from invading pathogens, but they're also capable of driving pathological inflammation. During viral infections, inflammation can act in a dynamically opposing antiviral and, and proviral roles. Inflammatory responses can inhibit viral replication and lower infection, but inflammation also has the capacity to release a large number of viruses. Further, knocking down decreasing viral infections to the cells like macrophages, which will spread the virus to various other tissues and organs in the host. The cytokine storm, also known as cytokine release syndrome, macrophage activation syndrome, is the result of an immune system gone wild. Killer cells are often defective, resulting in the increased production of inflammatory proteins that can lead to organ failure and death. <clears throat> the key takeaway, Cytokines are inflammatory immunological proteins that are there to fight off infections, but when they're out of control, they can make you very ill. So the bottom line with cytokines, it's very interesting that one of the reasons that the comorbidities pose such an issue 
all comorbidities increase inflammation and increase cytokines in your body. So now you're attacked by this virulent pathogen virus. So now your cytokines are released and now you have an abundance or storm, if you will. Whereas if you don't have these comorbidities, you have very little amount of cytokines. And then with the pathogen, even though you're increasing more than normal, you still don't have enough. The key takeaway here is it's not the virus that damages or kills people. It's the body's response to the virus. The cytokine storm or the overactivation of cytokines is what becomes very deleterious to people's health and organs. Mediators of the cytokine storm and associated phenotypes with infection outcome. Here we're seeing the cytokines can also damage endothelium in that they can cause endothelial dysfunction. They have inflammatory systematic responses and they can ultimately lead to pulmonary fibrosis. ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome or ALI, acute lung injury is this accumulation of neutrophils in the lungs and an increased production of the cytokines and chemokines. Both ARDS and ALI are from the cytokine storm and they're really both coming from the release of the NLRP3 inflammasome, which is really stimulating the innate immune system because of interleukin-1 beta and interleukin-18. Another way to look at the activation of the NLRP3 inflammasome. So you have an inflammatory marker stimulating toll-like receptor 4. Toll-like receptor 4 stimulates the pathway of the NF-kappa B, which we alluded to before as the signal transducer of inflammation, which is signal 1. You also have signal 2, which can also stimulate the inflammasome. Ultimately, these two signals together start the release of interleukin-1 beta and interleukin-18. The role of interleukin-1 beta in, in eliciting immune responses against infections. So here we're seeing a tremendous amount of interleukin-1 beta plays this key role in the regulation of neutrophil re recruitment through the induction of an adhesive molecule. It also upregulates the levels of interleukin-8 production, which acts as damaging and an activating factor for neutrophils, endothelial cells, and macrophages. Interleukin-6, excuse me, interleukin-1-beta is a cascade for inflammation. So how could we dim the release of the, or the stimulation of the NLRP3 inflammasome? Here are some of the ingredients that do so. EGCG green tea, quercetin, resveratrol, curcumin, ginger, boswellia, pro-resolving mediators, PEA, omega-3 fatty acids, vitamin D, melatonin, and alpha-lipoic acid. EGCG or green tea, you would have to drink four cups of green tea or take a normal dose of green tea, EGCG, molecular docking of seven proteins of SARS-CoV were tested, meaning these docks were at the ACE2 receptor sites. 18 compounds were compared with two FDA dr uh, past drugs in COVID-19. The drugs are there, remdesivir and chloroquine. Many of the aforementioned nutrients were also compared, all having a good positive outcome. EGCG, fit the best into the binding docs. It'd be drugs and other nutrients protecting the binding of the spike protein of COVID-19 on the ACE2 receptor sites. The conclusion simply stated, EGCG should be explored as a drug candidate for the treatment of COVID-19. Curcumin suppresses the cytokine storm. It's shown to decrease cytokine release, most importantly, the key pro-inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-1 or interleukin-1-beta, interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha. By suppressing the cytokines, it decreases the, the incidence of your cytokine storm. PEA 
actually helps promote relaxation and nerve functions used in a lot of peripheral neuropathies. In addition to that, it's produced naturally in every cell of the body in biological response to inflammatory markers. It's an extraordinarily well-researched nutrients with over 350 peer-reviewed papers. Nobel Prize devoted lots and lots of time and many indications to PEA, and it had positive trials in five out of six studies. Multiple mechanisms are associated with PEA. The anti-inflammatory are the inhibition of TNF-alpha and NF-kappa-B, and to promote immune support, it actually aided in mast cell stabilization, which actually decreased histamine and supported the ecobinoid system. In influenza, PEA worked by attenuating the potentially deadly cytokine storm. The dosing of PEA, PEA was marketed for the treatment of influenza, and the treatment of the common cold under the brand name Impulsin in the 60s and 70s. The dosing was generally 600 milligrams three times a day for up to three weeks. Vitamin D deficiency directly contributed to ARDS. So CLE, once again, vitamin D is excellent for any kind of upper respiratory distress. Excellent for the gut to lung axis. And great because it puts the brakes on a multitude of inflammatory pathways. Vitamin D receptor inhibits the NLRP3 inflammasome activation. It actually physically blocks the binding sites. Interesting. The mechanisms for innate and adaptive immune responses to vitamin D. Here we have the skin and the diet as we talked about. The takeaway in this slide is that it balances the innate and adaptive immune systems. And that's a critical element to overall health. So it really shows to decrease the antigen presentation, upregulates T cell function, and has an antibacterial activity. Maybe the best slide on vitamin C. It shows that the evidence that vitamin D supplementation could reduce the risk of influenza and COVID-19 infections and death. The mechanism which vitamin D plays in reducing respiratory tract infections was it was able to lower viral replication rates. It also lowered the concentration of cytokines. It lowered or reduced the risk of infections. 10,000 IUs per day of vitamin D for a few weeks was the starting point for the dosage. Then 5,000 IUs per day. Uh, it was, I think, one month. And the goal was to raise the concentration to vitamin D from 40 to 60. As I said earlier, I like even higher. The conclusion in this study in Nutrients 2020, April, for the treatment of COVID-19, D3 will be useful as a supplement. Pro-resolving mediators, one of my favorite supplements, pro-resolving mediators come from technically fish oils. Fish oils should convert, and I use the word should underline it and bold it, should convert to resolvents. Unfortunately, in most instances, and when I say most, 97% of people do not convert omega-3s to their resolvents because the host, us, or the population's pathways are not converting effectively. This is not an uncommon thing in many people of our current time period. Having said that, SPMs, when taken, or produced allow for the resolution of inflammation. They also allow for the homostasis between the initiation and the resolution for inflammation. You need a certain amount of inflammation to heal, to kill pathogens, if you will. But when that initial inflammation goes too high, it's detrimental to other structures. When it lasts too long, it becomes chronic and you get systemic inflammation. So PRMs, as they're commonly spoken about, do allow for that homostasis, balance, and ultimate resolution of inflammation. In the instance here, exogenous administration of precursors, SPMs, decreased pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokine expression, and it was able to decrease induced pulmonary inflammation. 
Resolvins also were very effective by preventing COVID-19 cytokine storms. They could turn off virus-induced inflammations by broadly activating PRMs. The resolvins stimulate the macrophage-mediated clearance of debris. Pro-inflammatory pro -inflammatory cytokine production inf or inflammation res resolution was provided by pro-resolving mediators. Their precursors or PRMs exhibit antiviral activity at doses without being immunosuppressive. SPMs, as they're also called, also promote antiviral B cell antibodies and lymphocyte activity. Lastly, resolvins can prevent COVID-19 cytokine storms by, in the conclusion is simple here, increasing levels of resolvins, lipid mediators in a body could be a therapeutic approach to preventing life-threatening inflammation caused by SARS-CoV-2. So this study was really looked at and it was very specific to COVID-19 and inflammation in the lung. And it showed when you gave SPMs, PRMs, you actually had resolution inflammation of injury to the lung alveolar area, which is the number one comprised area. So SPMs or PRMs are a critical element to produce or take exogenously. Melatonin, interesting. Most people don't think of melatonin of all of its health functions, but melatonin is also immunomodulating. It regulates mitochondrial functions. It has anti-inflammatory properties, antioxidant actions. It has va vasomotor uh, control. It aids to sleep. It also allows for the regulation of circadian rhythms. When it comes to respiratory virus infections, melatonin decreases acute lung oxidative injury, decreases pro-inflammatory cytokines, decreases inflammatory cell recruitments, and increases antioxidant production. Melatonin, in a study in Life Science, June 1st, 2020, blocked the release of excessive amount of interleukins. It also decreased oxidative stress and decreased the release of reactive oxygen species and contributing to its health benefits, it helps with sleep and decreases the cytokine storm. Alpha lipoic acid to me is a hidden gem. I think people should consume more alpha lipoic acid. It enhances the intracellular glutathione levels and it's shown to attenuate the increased susceptibility to human coronavirus. Unfortunately, the overexpression of interleukin-6 and its potential negative consequences on viral immune response, it knocks the balance off between Th1 and Th2. It doesn't allow for cytolysis and reduces the need for certain cell deaths. So the potential factors are an increase in virulence if you have the release of this stealthy cytokine called interleukin-6. Interleukin-6 is an important member of the cytokine network and plays a central role in acute inflammation. Interleukin-6 is a multifunctional cytokine, which plays an important role in human metabolism, autoimmune cell differentiation, disease treatment, and so on and so forth. In a very small study of nine patients that were COVID-19 positive, the symptoms appeared in, in this order. Fever, cough, dyspenia and fatigue. The difference between mild and severe COVID-19 symptomology is without question the difficulty in breathing. The common comorbidity for uh, COVID-19 was hypertension. Interleukin-6 was increased with body temperature. Interleukin-6 was increased with CRP, LDH, and D-dimer. The conclusion the dynamic change of interleukin can be used as a marker for severe COVID-19. This is a marker that regularly can be ascertained from normal blood panels. The NRF2 can inhibit interleukin-6 because everybody's going to say, well, you introduced interleukin-6, you gave it a problem, what's the solution? NRF2 is an elite antioxidant pathway that occurs in phase two of liver detoxification. To stimulate the NRF2 pathway, you would ingest or increase your ingestion, again, of DHA. You'd have caloric restriction, curcumin, green tea extract, milk thistle, alpha lipoic acid, 
So far, Fane, ashwagandha root, your good old java in the morning, and low-level laser therapy. The association of blood glucose control and outcomes in patients. This really, I mean, I took a real step back. The evidence that people with type 2 diabetes are at greater risk of a poor outcome should they be infected in COVID-19. The encouraging news was that people with type 2 diabetes whose blood sugar was well controlled fared much better than those with more poorly controlled blood sugars. A study was done with over 7,300 individuals. The findings in the study indicated that controlling blood glucose well may act as an effective auxiliary approach to improve the progress of patients with COVID-19 and pre-existing diabetes. Half a billion people in this world have diabetes and growing every day. This slide speaks to the idea of diabetes and coronavirus risk. Coronavirus enters the body. The outcome is simply the total amount of viruses, how much the virus replicates, how much replication occurs on the lung tissue, and the amount of cytokines utilized for immune response. These are the considerations. The bottom line here, or as I like to say, the takeaway is individuals with diabetes usually have a delayed immune response. Therefore, they'll probably have higher amount of viruses, more replication, more damage to the lung, and they're going to have a greater release of cytokines. Estrogenic compounds. Why do men seem to have a greater risk of getting COVID-19 than women? The simple thing is that females generally mount a more robust immune response to viral challenges than men. Estrogenic compounds is found to aid in virus clearance. Majority of the men with COVID-19 have low T. So not only is estrogen and estradiol protective, most American men are suffering from low T. That leads you down a path that actually low T makes you correlate or with inflammatory markers of interleukin and interleukin-6. So the bottom line, or if you will, the conclusion, critically ill male COVID-19 patients suffer from severe testosterone deficiencies. Both dehydrotestosterone and testosterone are required to mount an antiviral immune response to combat infection in males. And this begins to resonate once again. Comorbidities, our body's not functioning normally or appropriately for our biological age or our biological and our chronological ages. Another study that compared men to women, the use of the swap test, 68 subjects, median age 37, 48 males, 20 females. FIBA, females were able to achieve viral clearance significantly earlier than males. Family members were also studied. The ACE2 and specific repositories were considered. Men having testes had one of the highest sites of ACE2 expression. High ACE2 expression in testes suggests possible existence of gender specific viral reservoirs. Fecal oral tr or transmission, what they're finding out is, and I'll try and put this in a very concise manner, that the virus gets shedded in fecal material. So the average symptomology of COVID-19 is showed in day 5.1. The first five days, you're shedding viruses. That's where you can spread it more so than necessarily just the droplets. So you have to be very careful when you use a public bathroom because fecal orally, things can get spread. After that, after the abatement of fever, which was the number one symptom, it takes about 28 days to actually virally pass through the stool all of those viral particles. So once again, fecal oral transmission. Many of the uh, patients had some GI discomfort, tremendous amount of uh, ACE2 receptor sites in the gut. Finally, 53.4% of patients had a SARS-CoV-2 RNA in a stool. 23% of the patients tested positive in stool despite testing negative for the virus in respiratory samples. So finally, in addition to the respiratory tract, it's been stressed that clinicians be careful to promptly identify patients with initial GI symptomology. Gut microbes, can they predict COVID-19 severity? 
A healthy gut microbe may improve COVID-19 outcomes. The gut is affected in half of symptomatic patients. 20 proteins were associated with disease severity. Your protea risk score, there was a 10% increase, showed a 50% higher risk of infection. It's all correlated with HSCRP, TNF-alpha, and correlated with people over 58. The conclusion was the microbiome alterations occurred before change was reflected in the PRS, making it possible that dysbiosis and unleveling of good and bad bacteria causes protein alterations and not the other way around. The gut plays a major, major role in everybody's overall health. As I get to my slide that I use in all my different webinars and seminars, your gut, 80% of your immune cells are in your gut. It's where your macro and micronutrients are absorbed. So let's just briefly look at this. When your gut is too permeable or you have leaky gut, and you can have leaky gut from an increase in yeast and fungus or a food sensitivity, too much sugar, bad food, environmental toxins, or dysbiosis, and a leveling of good and bad bacteria. Your gut is too permeable. It puts a toxic stress or toxic overload on your liver. When you have that toxic or chemical overload on your liver from your gut, you're going to get liver dysfunction. Gut to liver, liver to gut. We talked about that before. Critical element, a true axis. Your gut is your epicenter of your health. Do you have the guts to be healthy? Leaky gut leads you down a path of increased blood sugar problems, insulin resistance, prediabetes, and diabetes. In addition, leaky gut leads you to a higher incidence of obesity and autoimmunity. You will not see it here, but leaky gut leads you to a higher incidence of rheumatoid arthritis and, of course, thyroid issues. Leaky gut, we're all chiropractors. We all have to realize that gut plays a major role in joint dysfunction. The release of cytokines can come from your gut. That increases your incidence of arthritis and joint pain and joint injuries. The release of MMPSs, matrix metalloproteinases, your body's own proteolytic enzymes, which were released at the time of injury, can also eat fibrocartilage and lead you down a path of injuring soft tissue. Leaky gut, leaky brain. Gut on fire, brain on fire. The gut to brain axis, the brain to gut axis. A leaky gut decreases satiety and increases inflammatory neurodegeneration in the brain. And as we get to the end, I'd like to just briefly go over what I would do for someone who had a gut problem, or if you will, my super seven R action plan. R number one, you want to reset your diet and lifestyle and mindset. When I say diet, keto diet, paleo diet, no sugar, no gluten, no dairy, increase your water, get a happy mindset, remove. What do you want to remove? unwanted pathogens. So you use oregano oil for upper respiratory pathogens, berberine for lower bowel pathogens, garlic, your own natural antimicrobial. This is a good time also to incorporate a detoxification plan to support phase one and phase two of your liver and remove the toxins going from your liver or toxins coming from your gut to your liver. Replace. Replace digestive enzymes, pancreatic enzymes, stomach acids, and bile regenerate, repair, heal and seal the damaged gut, intestine, and mucosa. You'll need a plethora of different nutrients for that, many of which start with okra, NAG, glucosamine HCL, L-glutamine, MSM, alpha lipoic acid, vitamin D, and omega-3 fatty acids. Reinoculate. Reinoculate with quality pre and probiotics. You really don't want to take a probiotic without a prebiotic. A prebiotic feeds the probiotic. Then you want to reintroduce. You want to retest certain foods that you removed. At a certain point, those food sensitivities may have resolved because you fixed the gut lining. And last, you want to retain your health and your GI integrity. And you'll do so with a good diet, a good lifestyle, a good phyto multi, an omega-3, a vitamin D, a probiotic, and hopefully a good dynamic fruit and greens drink. As we end, I hope everybody to please keep an eye out for my book, my upcoming book, Super Highway to Health, The Seven Steps to Optimizing the Gut-Brain Connection. You just saw a small microcosm of it in the last 60 minutes. 
Jim Rome, a fav of mine, said, take care of your body. It's the only place that you have to live. And if anybody needs to get in touch with me, there's my website, info at DR Robert Silverman. Love you to follow my Facebook and my LinkedIn and my Instagram at DR Robert Silverman. And there's a Facebook group that I have that's a mastermind laser group. I'm available for all your questions. It's been my pleasure. I hope to hear from you. Please, everybody, let's keep up that good work. And thank you very much for your time and best.